Um, our second two main components are going to be our lifestyle pieces. So first, we have an active lifestyle. So just naturally, based on where they live, um, their living situation, the buildings that they have, um, they typically just have a little bit more activity naturally in their everyday life. And when I say that, I don't necessarily mean, you know, they go to the gym every day or five days a week for an hour or two hours, um, but really this activity level is built into their everyday life. So for example, a lot of these countries and a lot of these people are not accustomed to having their own car. Um, so they are not necessarily driving to all of their errands. A lot of times they will be walking longer distances to the grocery store or the markets. Um, they might be biking longer distances as well, but a lot of times they are not jumping in the car um, to run errands. So they're getting their activity level in that way. Um, especially in parts of Europe as well, a lot of the buildings are a lot older. And so if you live in a three or four story apartment, um, you know, most likely you might not have an elevator in your building. So again, if you are going up and down those three or four flights of stairs eight or 10 times a day, you're carrying all of your groceries up those stairs, all your supplies up and down those stairs, it really just kind of builds that activity level very naturally into your lifestyle. And then finally, our last component is going to be leisurely mindful eating. Um, so they really take the time to sit down and appreciate their meal time. Um, they, they take it as a time to not only kind of unwind, um, but also to gather with friends and family and really just appreciate that social aspect as, as well as that eating aspect. Um, like I said, a lot of times they eat their larger meal more towards the middle of the day. Um, and in countries, especially like Spain and France, um, these countries a lot of times will actually have kind of a siesta hour where their entire town, all of the businesses, all of the shops, they actually shut down for two or three hours in the afternoon, um, really giving everyone kind of a time to have a chance to have a nice leisurely meal, um, kind of unwind before going back to work in the afternoon. All right, so some long-term health benefits of the Mediterranean lifestyle. Like I mentioned, there has been countless studies and tons of research done on the Mediterranean diet or lifestyle. Um, and the results are very, very consistent. So first and foremost, it has been found to help to reduce weight, blood pressure, and cholesterol. So those are kind of our big three um, that without a doubt, taking these steps is going to help to reduce those. Studies have also found reduce, um, reduced risk of potentially other chronic diseases. So that can include cancer, cardiovascular disease, metabolic syndrome, Alzheimer's, cognitive decline, Parkinson's, and diabetes. And the dependency of these reduced risk is a little bit more individual specific. So it depends on you know, your genetics, predisposition to certain diseases, lifestyle choices, um, but it certainly has shown to affect the reduce in these um, to reduce the risk of these diseases. And with that, um, the more closely the diet was followed, the lower the incidence of these diseases was found. So we're going to go through eight specific key dietary components to the Mediterranean diet. Um, and the nice thing about this lifestyle is you can really kind of customize it or tailor it to your individual life. Um, so if you want to pick and choose certain pieces to incorporate into your life, that is totally fine. Um, but just keep in mind that the more closely it was followed and the more of these that you incorporate, the better your results will be at reducing your weight, your blood pressure and cholesterol, um, as, as well as those risks of those other chronic diseases. All right, so these are going to be our eight key dietary characteristics of the Mediterranean lifestyle. And we will go through each of these individually and some of the health benefits associated with them as well. So first we have a limited intake of highly processed foods. 
So I don't think it's any secret to us that processed foods are going to be full of, you know, some of that bad stuff. So more sodium, sugar, artificial flavors, colors, preservatives, um, things like that. And in turn, it's going to usually have less of our, our good nutrients, such as fiber, um, vitamins, and minerals. So with the Mediterranean lifestyle, we want to try to consume foods in their most original whole form. And the definition of a whole food is a food that has been processed or refined as little as possible and is going to be free from any of those additives or artificial substances. Um, so highly processed foods, to be honest, can be a little bit tricky. Um, I know when I think of highly processed foods, the first things that come to mind are definitely all of those junk foods. So potato chips, sweets, cookies, crackers, um, all those junk foods that we know are typically going to be high in things such as sodium and sugar. Um, but highly processed foods can actually be hiding in a lot of foods that we might otherwise be considering to be a healthy option. And a good example of that is actually anything made with white flour. Um, so white breads, white pizza crusts, white tortillas, um, pastas, traditional pastas, all of those are also going to be considered highly processed foods. So that is going to lead us to our dietary characteristic number two, which is to incorporate more whole grains. Um, so whole grains, are going to include all of those nutrients, so B vitamins, fibers, a variety of minerals. Um, as you can see on this photo on the right, that is a diagram of a whole wheat kernel. So we can see our largest chunk in the center of that kernel is called the endosperm. And then we have two smaller components called the germ and the bran. And the germ and the bran are actually where like 99% of the nutrients are stored. And when grains are refined or processed, we basically wipe out that bran and the germ completely. And in turn, basically we get rid of all the nutrients that that whole grain ever had. So by incorporating anything made with white flour, again, white bread, white pizza crust, white tortillas, um, they really have very, very little nutritional value as a result. We're using that biggest component of the wheat kernel, which is the endosperm, um, but it has very, very little nutrients involved. So we want to try to incorporate more, more whole grains whenever possible. So typically whole grain has become kind of a buzzword. So usually if a product is whole grain, it's pretty well marketed that way. So it's going to be well advertised, um, pretty easy to spot on the packaging a lot of times. But just in case, you can always look at the ingredient list on the package and the first ingredient should always say either whole grain or whole wheat. And that's a good indication that you're getting that whole grain source and you're getting those nutrients from those whole grains. Um, so just some examples in these photos below. Again, just a whole grain bread. Um, it's going to do so much more for your diet than a white bread would. Oatmeal is also a really good source of whole grains. Um, and then finally, we have what looks like a quinoa. Again, mixed with a very vibrant, colorful plate of, you know, fruits or vegetables, um, different herbs, different flavors as well. So some of the whole, the whole grain health benefits, um, again, we want to make sure that it's minimally or not processed in order to maintain our high nutritional content. Um, but with whole grains, typically they're going to be very high in fiber, B vitamins, um, minerals, including magnesium, iron, and selenium, and then sometimes phytochemicals. And specifically with the high fiber, this is going to do a lot of different things for our body. So first off, it's going to help to slow digestion to help keep us feeling full longer. It also helps to regulate blood sugar, and it also helps to better remove waste and keep our GI tract kind of moving smoothly. And then again, it may help to lower blood pressure, cholesterol, BMI, and triglycerides. So again, this is gonna be a little bit more um, on an individual case-by-case -case basis, but the research has shown the possibility of decreasing those as well. 
All right, so number three is going to be incorporating a wide variety of fruits and vegetables into your diet. So typically in the Mediterranean region, they are eating a lot of different fruits and vegetables. And because of that, they're receiving a lot of different nutrients because the nutrients in each fruit and vegetable is going to be slightly different. Um, so by incorporating a wide variety, you're getting that variety of nutrients as well. They typically like to select and eat more seasonal foods um, and oftentimes local foods as well. So being here in Colorado, I realize that this can be a little bit more difficult. Um, you know, we have a limited supply of foods that we can grow here. We have a short growing season um, compared to the Mediterranean region where it's a little bit warmer, a little bit more humid. Um, they can typically grow a lot more different types of fruits and vegetables. But when possible, especially in the summer and fall, um, try to choose something that's you know in season and it's going to be local. That's just going to give you that very best fresh quality um, of those fruits and vegetables. They also typically have a larger portion of fruits and vegetables um, with every meal. So they are incorporating fruits and vegetables, you know, three meals a day. And a lot of times it's taking up at least half of their plate with every meal. Um, so this is something that we don't necessarily see a lot of times in America. We see a lot more um, of our plate maybe going to a protein source or a carb source, um, but they really incorporate a lot of fruits and veggies. And then finally, they will eat fruit as a dessert a lot of times as well. Um, so again, they try to stay away from those highly processed desserts um, that we oftentimes love, um, but they will replace it with something that's still gonna be sweet and satisfying, um, but maybe a fruit mixture or a type of fruit. So some of the health benefits to fruits and veggies, um, most fruits and vegetables are going to be very high in nutrients and low in calories. And so this is the ratio that you really want if you are looking to either maintain or lose weight. Um, fruits and vegetables are also going to typically be high in fiber. So just like with the whole grains, that's gonna help to regulate your blood sugar, keep you full, um, as well as keep your digestive tract running smoothly. And especially fruits are typically going to be high um, in different beneficial bioactive compounds such as antioxidants. And so again, antioxidants has kind of become a buzzword over the years, um, but essentially what they do is help to protect the body against free radicals or toxins. Um, so antioxidants are a really great way to just kind of boost and keep your immune system in tip top shape. And especially with everything going on now um, with COVID-19 and cold and flu season fast approaching, it's always a good idea to incorporate more antioxidants just to kind of keep your immune system as balanced as it can be. And again, research has shown that greater consumption of fruits and vegetables is associated with just an all around lower risk for those various chronic diseases. All right, so number four is going to be less red meat. Um, so they really don't eat a lot of red meat in the Mediterranean region. Um, you know, it's consumed certainly less than once a week, maybe a couple times a month. And they're going to be replacing their protein with pretty much any other source. So for animal-based proteins, we see that they eat a lot of seafood, um, a lot of poultry and eggs. Um, and they actually consume most of their protein from plant-based sources. So that can be beans, nuts, legumes, seeds, things like that. And again, just looking at these pictures, you can see just how colorful they are, you know, how many fruits and vegetables are in those, um, just to give you a kind of idea of what those Mediterranean diet pictures really look like. All right, so some of the health benefits to seafood specifically. Um, seafood is an excellent source of heart healthy monounsaturated fatty acids. So that is, it's a good source of good fat um, and it's low in saturated fat, which is also good. Um, this is going to help to increase our HDL or good cholesterol and is a protective mechanism against coronary heart disease. So again, um, this entire diet can be very effective and very beneficial to heart health, but 
seafood in particular um, is, a, is something that you can incorporate into your diet that will kind of go above and beyond to really protect against that coronary heart disease if that's a specific concern to you. Um, seafood, especially fatty acids, fatty fish, excuse me, such as salmon, tuna, and sardines are also a great source of the omega-3 fatty acids. So again, good source of a good fat. Um, and those are going to help to fight inflammation and again, protect against chronic disease. All right, so number five is olive oil as a main source of fat. And so this one is kind of crazy, um, but they use a ton of olive oil in everything they do. And one way that that is beneficial is that it, it's a good source of fat. Um, so it can replace a bad source of fat, such as butter or margarine, in a lot of ways. Um, and they actually eat up to about 40% of their total calories per day coming from olive oil. So again, that is kind of mind blowing. Um, but olive oil, it's, it's not a low calorie food for sure. Um, typically about one tablespoon of olive oil is about 150 calories. So you can see if you consume a lot of olive oil, those calories will add up eventually. Um, but again, we need calories to survive, we need fat to survive, um, but olive oil is going to be a good source of calories and a good source of fat. So it's all about knowing you know, how to create those calories in a, in a healthy way. Um, they also will receive the, the same types of nutrients and values from whole olives. So a lot of those dishes that we've seen examples of so far, um, they maybe incorporate chopped vegetables or olives um, and then have an olive oil drizzle on top of that. But like I said, they use olive oil in almost every component of their cooking. Um, so they'll use it on salads for a salad dressing. They will use it in soups. Um, they will use it as a dip for breads rather than spreading a butter or margarine on their breads. They will use it when cooking pasta and meats as well. So lots of different ways to incorporate olive oil into your diet. And very similarly to the seafood, um, olive oil is a very heart healthy component. So it's gonna have those, those good heart healthy monounsaturated fats again. Um, this is gonna increase your good cholesterol and be a protective mechanism against coronary heart disease. Um, olive oil also possesses an anti-inflammatory and anti-clotting property. So again, that's going to be beneficial to heart health. Um, and it is also an antioxidant. So again, just kind of helping to boost that immune system um, by ridding your body of toxins. All right, so number six is going to be a moderate dairy intake. So to be honest, they really don't eat a lot of dairy products. Um, when they do, it's going to be in the form of cheese and yogurt usually, and it's in, in very much small to moderate amounts, um, you know, eaten maybe a few times a week. So they are, they're definitely not typically eating yogurt every morning for breakfast. Um, they're not incorporating cheese into their everyday diet as well, um, but typically in a very small to medium amount. And with yogurt specifically, they're typically going to eat Greek yogurt, um, the fully fat and plain variety. And the reason for that goes back to our consuming foods in their most whole form. And so when we go to the grocery store, um, the yogurt section can be kind of overwhelming. And there's a lot of marketing involved, there's a lot of labels, and there's a lot of buzzwords. So we see words such as low fat, no fat, um, light, sugar free, things like that, um, as well as the flavors. A lot of the flavors are starting to sound more like a dessert rather than a breakfast item. So we see flavors such as key lime pie or creme brulee or s'mores. Um, and with all of that comes processing. So it becomes processed, it becomes refined, and additives are involved. So in order to get those flavors, um, there's a lot of artificial flavors that go into that. There's a lot of sugar that goes into that. So going back to that consuming foods in the most whole form, um, even though it's full fat, which you might think is you know, not as good as low fat or no fat, um, from this perspective, it's the least processed because when we do, remove fat, 
or um, remove sugar or calories, that is a type of processing. So typically they'll have the full fat plain version and they'll use something more natural to flavor it with. Um, so you can use, you know, fresh fruit or berries, um, different granolas or nuts or honey is a really great option as well, rather than all of those artificial sweeteners, sugars, and flavors. And like I said, the serving sizes are pretty small. Um, so for one serving of yogurt would be one cup. And for one serving of cheese, it would be one ounce of cheese. And so um, sorry to all of you cheese lovers out there, but that is about two to three small diced pieces of cheese. Um, so it's not a lot. And I think this photo on the right down here does a really good job of showing, um, you know, an example of what you would see in the Mediterranean region. So two or three small diced pieces of cheese and then it's surrounded by, again, those vegetables, those olives, um, and then again drizzled with probably some sort of olive oil sauce or um, maybe mixed with a vinegar or something like that. All right, so number seven is red wine in moderation. So who doesn't love a diet that encourages you to drink red wine, right? Um, but typically it's gonna be generally consumed with meals. So they don't drink just to drink. They don't, you know, have cocktail hours or anything like that. Um, but again, this is something that they appreciate with their food and very much in moderation. Um, so for women, that would be one serving a day. And for men, that would be up to two servings a day, with a serving size being five ounces. And again, I would encourage you to measure out what five ounces looks like and put it in your wine glass at home, um, because a lot of our wine glasses, if we are left freely to pour ourselves, we could easily pour two or three servings um, into that glass without realizing it. So definitely be mindful of that serving size. Um, so the health benefits for red wine is very specific. Um, it's a property called resveratrol, which is a polyphenol, which again is going to act as an antioxidant, um, which is going to help protect the lining of the blood vessels in the heart, help to reduce that LDL or bad cholesterol, and help to protect against blood clots. So again, a very heart healthy component to this diet. Um, and resveratrol is found in purple or red grapes. So if you don't drink or you don't drink red wine, um, you certainly don't have to start in order to participate in this part of the diet. Um, you can get this property of resveratrol from eating red or purple grapes by themselves, um, or you can incorporate a red or purple grape juice and it will give you the same effect. All right, and then finally we have number eight is the use of fresh herbs and spices. And so they really like to use a lot of herbs and spices to really add flavor, color, and variety to dishes. Um, typically, our herbs and spices are not going to have a lot of nutritional value, um, but what they can do is help to replace salt, which is oftentimes consumed in excess in America. So it gives you an opportunity to really flavor your food um, without using too much salt. You can use herbs and spices in both the fresh or dried form. Um, and oftentimes they will actually go as far as to use a mortar and pestle to really grind and blend those herbs and spices um, to help extract the fragrant oils and the flavors. And again, um, just kind of taking the time to really appreciate that food that you're preparing um, and the flavors of those foods. So like I said, typically we don't have a lot of nutritional benefits from herbs and spices. Um, some of them can contain phytochemicals such as antioxidants, but the main thing that really comes from the herbs and spices is the reduce for the need of salt. Um, and this is gonna be particularly beneficial for those who may be on a low sodium diet. All right, so this is the Mediterranean lifestyle food pyramid. Um, and I think this is just a great representation visually of what we just talked about. And especially that component of the lifestyle piece. So as we can see, the base of this pyramid actually has nothing to do with any of the foods that we're consuming. Um, so the base of this whole lifestyle, this whole diet, um, is really that piece of being physically active, 
sitting down, enjoying meals with others. And then our biggest chunk of that pyramid with food is not going to have any meat products in it. So that's going to be our fruits and vegetables, our whole grains, olive oils, um, plant-based proteins such as beans, nuts, legumes, and then our herbs and spices. So our next category is going to be our most often consumed animal-based protein, which again is going to be in the form of fish and seafood. And then getting towards the top, um, eaten less often is going to be our poultry, eggs, cheese, and yogurt, so our dairy products. And then at the very top of this pyramid, it, eaten most seldomly, probably America's two favorite things, which are red meats and desserts. So I think this does a really good job of putting into perspective kind of where we're at as a country and a culture of food um, and where that Mediterranean region is at and kind of some of the key differences for us. All right, um, so next we're going to go through some tips for following the Mediterranean lifestyle. And you know, like I said at the beginning, it's, the thing that's really nice about this lifestyle, we talked about, you know, eight different key dietary components. We talked about several lifestyle components and you can really customize this to your comfort level, your ability level, um, and work your way up from there. So again, the closer you follow all of these recommendations, the better your results are likely to be. Um, but certainly you can start small and gradually work your way up. So the first tip is to be mindful. Um, so try to sit down and really plan your meals, make a grocery list and shop with intention. Um, so this is going to help you to stay on track with what you're eating, knowing what you're eating each week, um, help to kind of cut down on those impulse buys at the grocery store or maybe not having a plan for dinner. Um, and going to the drive through or the takeout menu um, before we really think about, you know, what we're eating. We would also encourage you to sit down to eat, avoid eating on the go. So typically, you know, in America, we are a very on the go society. And a lot of times we are slamming our food in between dropping off someone at practice or rehearsal or going to an evening activity or meeting up with friends. Um, you know, we're eating in the drive through line or in the parking lot, and it can be really difficult to really sit down and take that time. Um, I think, you know, one benefit of this whole pandemic situation has really been that it has forced a lot of us to slow down um, and really has kind of given us that opportunity to maybe plan our meals out more accordingly, sit down and eat, um, enjoy that time with family and maybe some friends. Um, but again, they really take the time to enjoy your food slowly, um, really appreciate that smell, that texture, and that flavor. So our, our second tip would be to select more whole grains. Um, so our first recommendation would be to try to make more than half of your whole, of your grains whole grain. So again, um, I think that's a very obtainable goal. So we're not necessarily asking you to cut out all processed grains, um, but try to look for some ways to incorporate whole grains into your everyday diet um, and maybe try to go from half to a little bit more than half of those being whole grain. Um, so again, usually it's very well marketed when something is whole wheat or whole grain, um, but you can always look on the ingredient list and it should say whole wheat as the first ingredient if it's a whole grain. Um, but you can incorporate this with breads, pastas, pizza crusts, tortillas, um, different rice or other types of carbs. Um, another way that's really easy to incorporate whole grains is to use whole wheat flour instead of white flour when baking. So especially if you enjoy baking, um, this is like a freebie because it doesn't change the taste at all. It doesn't change the texture at all. Um, it's just like secretly sneaking in those whole grains to something that you're already baking um, when, when using that whole wheat flour instead of white flour. You can also experiment with some different types of whole grains. So um, things such as quinoa, farro, or bulgur are things that we don't necessarily see a lot of times 
used often in America, um, but you can find them at the grocery store. They're all going to be similar to a quinoa or rice um, type of texture and type of food. Um, but you can add these to soups, casseroles, salads, or you can simply use them as a side dish in your meal. Again, eating oatmeal for breakfast is a really easy way to get in a ton of whole grains right from the start of the day. Um, and again, I would caution you buying store-bought instant oatmeal because sometimes those, those can be highly processed. Um, they have a lot of additives in them. A lot of them have, you know, really yummy flavors in them. But again, with that is going to come those artificial sugars, sweeteners, flavors, um, et cetera. So when you can, I would recommend using just a plain oat um, for your oatmeal. And then again, with like the yogurt, trying to flavor them more naturally. And then for those with diabetes, um, we just want to make sure that you balance your whole grains by pairing them with a protein source. Um, so that can be something such as nuts, fish, cheese, or a nut butter. So our next tip is going to be eating more veggies and fruits. So like I mentioned earlier, typically their, their plates are going to be at least half full with fruits and veggies um, at every meal. So again, this is something that you can kind of decide where you want to start and where you want to go with this. Um, so you can, you know, make a goal of maybe doing this one meal a day or maybe try to do this two or three times a week and really work your way up from there. Um, so this doesn't have to be an immediate um, all or nothing change. It can be very gradual and it can be very customizable to your lifestyle. You wanna to try to select a variety of different tastes, textures, and nutrients from your fruits and veggies. Again, try to choose them when they are in season and purchase locally when you can. Um, you can prepare cut veggies or sliced fruits for an easy and convenient snack. That's, an, that's a great way to just pop in a few fruits or vegetables there in the middle of the day. Um, and don't get stuck in a rut. So there are a ton of different fruits and vegetables out there that you can experiment with. Um, and there's a lot of different cooking varieties and different recipes out there as well. So specifically for vegetables, you know, you can eat them fresh and raw. Um, you can saute them, you can steam them, blanch them, roast them, grill some of them even. Um, so I really encourage you guys to kind of get creative and don't get bored with those fruits and veggies. And then finally, we would encourage you to incorporate veggies into your breakfast. So a lot of times we don't necessarily think about incorporating a lot of vegetables into our breakfast meals. Um, a lot of times we maybe pair a fruit more likely with a, with a breakfast. Um, but there's several ways you can do this. You can always just throw a few slices of tomato or cucumber on your toast or bagel. Um, you can include sauteed vegetables or spinach in your eggs or omelet. And you can always add spinach or kale or other leafy greens to a smoothie um, for a really easy way to just incorporate some, some quick veggies into your diet. All right, so our next tip is to add olive oil. So like I said, they are using a lot of olive oil, um, up to 40% of their calories per day. A lot of their fat comes from olive oil. So again, if you don't wanna go all out on the olive oil, that's totally fine. Um, but try to incorporate it a little bit in each, of each meal or each day. Um, the first thing you can do is use olive oil as a healthy replacement for butter or margarine. So whether that be in a dip, um, for bread, using olive oil rather than spreading that butter or margarine on your bread. Um, you can use it to add to a pasta sauce or a soup to replace heavy creams or heavy cream sauces. Um, and you can combine it with olive oil and vinegar to toss in your salad as a salad dressing. So like I said earlier, um, in your follow-up email, you will actually get a recipe for making a homemade olive oil salad dressing. And then when possible, you should choose extra virgin olive oil most often. So this is a really nice table um, with all of the different types of olive oil and kind of a description of them, the taste, and then some recommendations for uses. So again, the olive oil aisle can be kind of confusing. There's a lot of different options out there. 
Um, and that word light, again, is kind of a buzzword for us here in America. Um, we don't necessarily know what it means, but we think it means something good. So it's probably, you know, light on calories or fat or somehow it's better for you. Um, but in this case, the word light really just means that it's been pretty heavily refined um, and it's not that good a quality. So whenever possible, extra virgin olive oil is going to be our highest quality um, oil. And it's made from just a single press of those olives. It's, it has no heat or chemical added. So it's gonna have our very best quality taste. Um, so we should always use it when taste is really going to matter. So that can be with dips or spreads, um, salad dressing, or even drizzled on fish. The next is gonna be just regular virgin olive oil. Um, so this is again, not highly processed, um, but it's not necessarily quite as high quality as that extra virgin olive oil. So it's still gonna have a good taste, um, but it's not that top quality. So it's gonna be a good option for some sauteing or maybe light cooking um, of vegetables or meat. And then olive, light, and pomace are all going to be very highly processed. Um, a lot of times they will be combinations of different olive oils, possibly from different countries. So if you look at the source of, um, on the label, it's very interesting. A lot of them will say, you know, combined oil sources from Spain, France, Italy. Um, some of them have, you know, up to 12 different sources of oil um, in that single bottle. But basically these have been highly refined, so we wouldn't recommend them as a source of a whole food. And they really don't have that great of a flavor. So we would only recommend using these if the flavor is really not important. So if you're maybe just, you know, pan frying or frying some sort of food, um, obviously there is a price difference between that extra virgin quality and that light or promise. Um, so again, it's kind of up to you and your discretion um, of how you use those different types of olive oil. Our next tip is going to be to pick your protein wisely. Um, so we would recommend, you know, maybe aiming to substitute fish or poultry for red meat. Um, and again, this is very flexible and dependent on how much red meat you're consuming currently. Um, so maybe, you know, you want to substitute that fish or poultry for one meal a week or a couple meals a month. Um, again, very customizable to your lifestyle. Um, but again, we would recommend aiming to eat fish at least once, maybe twice a week. And again, I realize, um, especially for those of us in landlocked Colorado, um, we don't necessarily have those fresh fish and seafood options that they would have in the Mediterranean region. Um, but, you know, do what you can um, with what we have. Um, keeping almonds, cashews, pistachios, walnuts, any kind of nuts are a great quick snack, just like those cut veggies. Um, and again, if you are trying to make, you know, smaller meals more often throughout the day, um, something like just a small thing of some mixed nuts and a cut fruit or vegetable is a great option to kind of keep that metabolism going strong. We would also recommend choosing a natural peanut butter. Um, when possible, because a lot of those peanut butter brands that we see in the stores are made with hydrogenated fat, and again, are going to be very highly processed. Um, tahini is also a great option. It's made from sunflower seeds, um, but it's incorporated into a lot of different, different dips or spreads for breads or fruits or vegetables. Um, tahini is a main component of hummus, so that kind of gives you an idea of the flavor. And then again, for those of you um, with diabetes, we just wanna make sure that you're pairing a protein food with any high carb food. So a peanut butter with an apple, cheese and crackers, um, and nuts with you know, yogurt and granola. All right, next tip is raise a glass to healthy eating. So again, if it's okay with your doctor, um, if you want to have a glass of wine, um, you can, if you don't drink or you don't drink red wine, you definitely don't have to start. Um, but this resveratrol property is going to be found in any bottle of red wine. So it doesn't have to be a specific type or variety. It doesn't have to be a fancy or expensive variety. Um, any red wine will do. 
And again, if you want that property of that antioxidant, but you don't drink red wine, um, you can drink purple grape juice or you can eat just the grapes themselves and you'll still get those benefits. Our next tip is going to be to stay active. So aim for about 150 minutes per week. Um, and again, this doesn't have to be going to the gym or running for an hour straight every day. Um, just something that, you know, is a, a moderate activity such as walking or gardening or even cleaning the house, just kind of getting up, getting moving um, and doing something active. If you want to incorporate something a little bit more vigorous, try running or biking or hiking or swimming. Um, those are all great options that are get you outside, get you some fresh air and some sunshine as well. And then we just want to remind you that water is important for hydration, especially during exercise. So um, we didn't talk a lot about drinking products except for that red wine, um, but water is definitely important in any diet and especially here in Colorado at altitude. Um, it's very hot here in Southern Colorado currently, so we want to make sure that you're staying well hydrated. And then finally, making changes gradually. So I've talked about this throughout the presentation, um, but the nice thing about this is it's really very customizable. Um, so it's not something that, you know, you are restricting yourself, um, you are jumping all in and cutting all these foods out. You know, you can really choose um, how you wanna make these changes, how many changes you wanna make at a time. Um, so you can make, you know, one change at a time and add a new one each week or each month or kind of see how it's going and really try to build it up to a lifestyle um, rather than just a diet or a crash diet that we're doing for three months or six months. Um, this is something that can be extremely sustainable if it's done correctly. Um, and then just a few reminders following this lifestyle, it's not about restriction. So again, even though they're eaten in the less often terms, the red meat and the desserts were still on there. Um, so you don't have to cut those out entirely. Um, the dairy products are still on there. Um, so again, you just wanna make sure that you're maybe being a little bit more conscious of the foods that you're eating and how often you're eating them. All right, um, so those are my references. And with that, I will take any questions. It looks like I have a couple in the chat, I only have about eight minutes, um, but I'll try to get to as many as I can. Let's see here. So will grape juice be just as beneficial as red wine? I think I already answered that one, and the answer is yes. Um, what's the best oil for sauteing with? I think that was, these are so far kind of easy, um, but I think that one was in that little table as well. Um, so for sauteing flavor, you know, might matter a little bit. So I would recommend using kind of a mid-grade olive oil at least. Um, you can always use extra virgin olive oil if you want that total benefit of that whole, most whole form, less processed. Um, but again, if you're looking to kind of save a little money, um, you can drop down to the regular virgin oil um, or even something a little bit lighter depending on how much flavor is going to matter. Um, another question, is pork considered red meat? So yes, it is. Um, it's kind of that, that mystery meat, um, but based on the bioactive compounds in the meat, it is more closely related to that of a true red meat than it would be to a poultry or a white meat. Um, so for that reason, we would categorize it as a red meat and we would recommend eating it sparingly. Um, are California olive oils better than imported? Um, so from, from a supporting local standpoint, I would say potentially, you know, you're supporting a little bit more of a local farmer um, rather than having those imported olives, but the growing conditions are going to be very similar. So the quality of the olive oil itself, um, I don't think has a, a, has a strong difference. Um, the thing with olive oil is I would really recommend that you check the label and see how many sources of olive oil are in that bottle. Um, and like I said, it's very interesting because some of them have a lot. They will have olive oil from 12 different countries, some of them. Um, so the, the ones in California are typically going to be a one source product. 
Um, but with that, a lot of times they're a little bit more expensive too. So something to kind of weigh for yourself um, and your priorities. Um, let's see. What leadership role can CSU make to di help diversify what fruits and vegetables are grown in the state to provide local access to these products? Every year, it seems a large percentage of our agricultural production is shifted to corn. Well, that is a, t a tough question. Um, you know, CSU Extension specifically has several research stations throughout the state, and they're always doing agricultural research. Um, we have the researcher and scientist who has actually created um, many of the Pueblo chili varieties for us here specifically in Pueblo, um, as well as the Rocky Ford melons. So he's genetically created all of those varieties of fruits and vegetables. So there's always research going on um, to help try to create as many different fruits and vegetables as possible. But we, we just are kind of limited, unfortunately, given our our arid climates and our short growing season and our type of soils. Um, but I do think, you know, CSU, the research is, is being done and it's ongoing for sure. Um, do you get the same benefit on farmed fish versus wild caught? So some benefits, yes, some benefits, no. Um, honestly, sometimes wild caught fish can have more detrimental properties in them, um, such as mercury poisoning that comes from the ocean. Um, so you just want to make sure that you're getting it from a reliable source. Um, a lot of farmed fish are, are pretty clean. Um, and so they're also a lot cheaper. So that can definitely be a good option, especially um, when we're not really getting anything super fresh, again, here in Colorado, um, being landlocked. We're not, we're not super close to the ocean. I would encourage you to check your labels. Um, fish can be kind of a scary thing because, you know, best case scenario, we are getting them shipped from maybe Alaska or the Pacific Northwest, um, maybe the East Coast, you know, that's best case scenario. Some of our seafood gets imported from as far away as like Japan or um, parts of Asia. So, with that, there's chances for sources of contamination. Um, you know, it's, it's crossed a lot of hands. It's been on a lot of planes or boats or um, different transportation devices. So as local as you can go would be my recommendation for fish. Um, do you have a so good source for recipes, especially entrees? Um, so there, I'm going to send you a couple recipes in this post email. Um, they're for salad dressing and hummus, but if you check out that CSU Extension website, there are a few more, or there's actually a lot of different recipes on there. Um, so I definitely encourage you to check that out. Um, I know there's a recipe for falafels and um, I think a tilapia too. So those are specific to the Mediterranean diet, but they also have a lot of other really great recipes on there. And you'll get a link to some of those recipes specific, but once you get on that website, you can kind of search for different options. All right, um, so what is a basic breakfast option? American breakfasts seem very carb heavy. Yes, definitely. Um, and if you're gonna go with a carb, again, try to keep it as whole grain as possible. Um, and you know, carbs, just like fats, just like calories, we need a certain amount of carbs. So don't be afraid of carbs, um, but just try to eat them appropriately. So again, trying to create that um, whole grain as much as possible. So like I mentioned, oatmeal is a really great option. Um, that's a really heart healthy option. It's a very filling option. It's got tons of fiber. Um, it's gonna be a whole grain. Um, to be honest, I went to Spain a couple years ago and their breakfasts are very different. Um, so they have pastries and stuff, but a lot of times they're eating um, different meats. So different like smoked fish, um, sometimes they will have seafood in their breakfast buffets. Um, they do, you know, eat that yogurt occasionally. Um, oatmeal is, is a really good one as well. Eggs are also a really good option. So there's definitely some options out there. Um, do you have any recommendations on cookbooks? So yes, I know there is one that CSU Extension recommends. Um, it might be on that resource list in the PowerPoint. I'd have to go back and check, um, but I can get that information for you and I'll send it to Rachel and it can go out in the post email. 
So you will get that information, but I don't have it off the top of my head. Um, what are some good sources of calcium you would recommend in this diet since di dairy is eaten less frequently? Um, this is a really good question. A lot of, you know, depending on how much calcium you really need, um, that part of the Mediterranean diet might not be your best option. Um, so like I said, a lot of this is going to be a little bit individual specific. Um, so if that part doesn't work for you um, and you really, you know, need that calcium amount, I would recommend incorporating that milk or that dairy product if you need it. Um, you can always use a calcium supplement as well. Um, but that's a question we get a, a lot of times. And, you know, if you are at a higher risk for osteoporosis or anything like that, um, you know, talk to your doctor before you make a lot of you know, crazy lifestyle changes. And sometimes, you know, parts of this maybe just aren't perfect for every single person. All right, I know we've got some, some talk in the chat. I don't know if there's any other questions in there. Um, it looks like there was one asking about cooking with red wine and if that was as helpful as consuming that five ounces of red wine. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, any type of consumption, um, that resveratrol is a pretty stable polyphenol. So even if you cook it a little bit, you should still see those benefits. Awesome. And then someone also asked about sweet red wine. Yeah, any red wine. Um, like I said, it comes from the grapes themselves. So any variety, any brand, um, you should still see those benefits. Awesome. And then I believe the other ones it looks like were put in the Q&A after they were put in the chat. Um, uh -huh. But we are out of time today. But I know Laura is available for questions. Um, if you felt like reaching out to her afterwards as well, as well yeah. as you know, you can look up your local county extension office too. Um, but Laura, thank you so much. This was so interesting. I'm definitely excited to incorporate some of this into my own diet at as I go along. So thank Perfect. you so much for your time today. Yep. Thank you guys and have a great day. Awesome. Go Rams. Thank you all. Take care.